Well hello there ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's video. After many backs and forths, yes or no, I finally made my decision to switch my daily driver over from Windows to Linux. Why? Why did I do that? Well for once I felt like trying out something new. I really like new technologies and that also counts for the software department. Linux changes all the time and I find that exciting. So what is Linux? Well Linux is an operating system just like Microsoft's Windows and Apple's Mac OS. However, in contrast to those operating systems, it's open source, which means that everyone has access to the resources needed to build their own custom version of Linux. When people talk about Linux, they usually don't mean the operating system itself, since this is just a piece of software that communicates with the hardware and UEFI, previously known as the BIOS. But what they really mean are distribution, or also called distros. As I mentioned before, due to its open nature, everyone who's skilled enough can build their own Linux version based upon the kernel. But with that comes a problem that Linux in general is facing nowadays. Choice. There are so many distros out there that it's almost impossible to track them anymore. Those many options are often scary for newcomers who don't know much about Linux yet. I mean, just check out the sheer amount of them. Picking the right distribution seems hard and is not really guided that well. So what should you choose? The answer is, it doesn't matter. For desktop use, you can literally make any distro look and feel the same like one another, while not giving up any functionality whatsoever. Many newcomers think that a specific design or certain features are tied to a specific distro. But this is not true in most cases. Linux, in contrast to Windows or macOS, doesn't simply have just one way to look. It has several different ones. Those come in the form of so-called desktop environments. The most popular ones are GNOME, KDE Plasma and Cinnamon, which already ship with many distros. And if not, just install them manually. My recommendation when it comes to choosing the right distro for you is just to look at the desktop environments, choose what you like and check if that desktop environment comes with a Linux distro. Once you've made your choice, then just check out the distro itself. If it's user friendly, if it's more for hardcore nerds. But the whole thing you don't want to do is just pick a distro just because someone said, no, this is the best distro uh, because it has those and those features. But no, this one's better because it has those features. It doesn't matter. You can just install those features on another distro. And there, it's just as easy as that. But why should you even consider using Linux? Well, for once, it comes with much less bloatware than Windows or Mac OS that not only slows down your PC, but also might collect data about you. The installation of programs is just as easy as heading to the software store, selecting the applications you want to install and just install them. In contrast to Windows, for example, where you always had to go to a website, download the .exe file and execute it, Linux has a different approach. On Linux, you typically don't download any files from the internet. The way how you install applications is through so-called repositories which are huge data banks filled with applications just ready to download. Everything's just sitting there and waiting. And even if something is missing, for example, proprietary drivers, then the option to go to the internet and download them from there is still there. So why did face in the thumbnail? Well, let's just say not everything works as smooth as it could be. While every application I personally use is available on Linux, certain features are missing. I was happy to find out that my editing program that I used on Windows, DaVinci Resolve, had a native Linux port. However, when I tried to edit my MKV and MP4 files, I discovered that I just couldn't import them, which was odd. After I did some digging, I found out that the free Linux version of DaVinci Resolve does not support the MP4 file format as well as the H.264 codec, which is to this day the web standard for videos on literally any video platform. This is a licensing issue since Windows and Mac OS already come with those codecs and pay the license for you. Linux on the other hand, due to its open source nature, does not. And even if you choose to buy DaVinci Resolve, it still doesn't support the AAC audio codec, which is also a standard. And personally, I don't like this at all, since you are paying the same amount of money as you would in Windows, but you get less. So. What to do? I had to convert every video I recorded into a different format and because it should be lossless, since I didn't want to lose any quality, the file size exploded. For example, a video file that only had 700 megabytes went up to up to 30 gigabytes. I mean, that's insane. 
It also takes some time to convert, and while it's converting, you cannot really do much editing, right? Another thing is that besides from importing MP4 files, I also cannot export them, which is really bad because that results in high quality file formats, which are not meant for the web and are therefore really big and therefore a long upload time. Yeah, that's not good. So yeah, when we are already talking about programs that don't quite work as well as they are on Windows, let's talk about OBS. My default repository from a Debian installation, which is the distribution I went with, doesn't offer the newest OBS version. And even if it does, it doesn't come with the browser source, which means no overlays for this guy. But wait, I was one step ahead and chose to install a different version of OBS, that being the Flatpak version. Flatpak is something many people praise to be Linux's next big step in software dis distribution. But it also comes with a lot of problems. For example, I couldn't get NVENC from my NVIDIA GPU to work, even though it showed up inside the OBS and the proprietary drivers were installed and working. I asked for a fix on the OBS Discord server in the Linux support channel, but even they couldn't help me. The solution? Building OBS from its source code. It was a very painful task because someone even messed up the GitHub repository from OBS and it kept downloading an older version. So I manually had to go through the installation steps just to get the newest version. And yeah, before you say it's probably my fault. No, not in that particular case. I covered several different programming languages. I worked with GitHub and even with Linux in the name of my study program. And that knowledge helped me to fix this issue. But for a newcomer? Well, no chance. The use of a console or the terminal for Windows and Mac OS users is typically related to debugging or something isn't working right. But on Linux, it's actually used because it's a really powerful tool. But for a person who does not know a single command, it sure is hell. Part of the problem was probably my choice of using Debian since it's not very beginner friendly. However, Flatback does not require a specific Linux distro. So the NVENC problem could have happened on any distro really. Another example for Flatback issues is Steam. Steam is an application that works very well on Linux. It's native, it works just like the Windows version. It's great. Except if you want to share your games on a separate hard drive between your Windows install and your Linux install. I currently have Windows and Linux installed simultaneously. That is because I need Windows for some compatibility issues and also for Valorant. This means that I also have some games installed and I don't want to re-download them on my Linux install when I'm on the same PC, literally. There are ways how you can mount other drives to Linux and usually it works really well, except you're using the Flatpak version because then be prepared to crack open the Flatpak sandbox and change some values in order to access these drives. But editing the sandboxed flatpak really defies a sandbox at all. And this of course goes through the whole philosophy of why we are doing sandboxing in the first place. However, this is just a niche problem, but be aware that such things could happen. So in conclusion, was it a good idea to change my daily driver? The answer is, yeah, it was. Even with those hiccups, that sounded really negative. Most things don't apply to the normal user. And now here come the really big advantages of Linux. It's fast, it's stable, it comes with a ton of applications right out of the box and it's customizable. Customizations was one of the main reasons why I wanted the Linux install. The default theme looks too boring. Well, let's add a bit of a blur. Want to make it look like Windows or Mac OS, but keep custom hotkeys? There you go. I find that the switch does not only make me more excited than ever to use my PC. It also helped me to be more productive while also giving me a challenge to find my own personal experience. And that's where I leave it. So if you like this video, make sure to leave a like and also subscribe. If you have any questions or you just want to talk, then hop into my live stream on my second channel. And without anything more to add, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are, I'll see you around.